Okay, welcome back everybody. We are going to be starting the endocrine system today. So let's take a close look at this. Um, and in this video, um, I'll probably incorporate a few other files um, and a few uh, videos along the way. Okay, um, so when we talk about the endocrine system, we have to also include the neural system in the discussion because both of these systems work together in maintaining homeostasis. And if we talk about homeostasis, we're really referring to a term that doesn't just create balance, right? When we hear the word homeostasis, we think it's this equal state of balance, like, like a seesaw that's right in the middle and it doesn't move. And that's just not the case, you know? So I'd like to think about homeostasis as a dynamic state of change where one side may elevate for a little bit and then it goes back in the other direction and the other side elevates. And it's like this teeter-tottering effect. So the neural system and endocrine system are both um, intricately involved with this and uh, they work together. Um, just in different fashion. One has effects that may be a more longer lasting and the other may be a little bit shorter lasting. So uh, the neural system and the endocrine system, they act together to coordinate all the systems of the body. Now the neural system is going to release neurotransmitters. So you will have, let's see if I can bring up my marker here for a second. So we can have this presynaptic neuron, right? And then we can have this, uh, let's do it this way, like a postsynaptic side. So here's the pre and then here's the post synaptic. <clears throat> and what we end up, ha what's happening here is that the presynaptic side ends up releasing these neurotransmitters through that method called exocytosis, right? Exocytosis is when you have this cell and it has a bunch of chemicals in here, right? We're just going to make a bunch of little dots or little lines. And when this thing opens up and it releases whatever that protein is inside, remember proteins can be hormones and enzymes and neurotransmitter. So when it releases it, that's exocytosis. And that's what's happening here. And it releases it in this direction to the postsynaptic side, and the membrane has a receptor on it. Okay. Um, so those are neurotransmitters, uh, while the endocrine system releases hormones. And most of the hormones that circulate through the blood, and they bind to receptors on target cells. Um, neurotransmitters also bind to receptors on target cells. So let's take a look at uh, one of these brief videos here, see if we can get this running. Okay, let's open that up a little bit more for you. Secretory products of endocrine cells are called hormones. Secretory vesicles release the hormones into the extracellular fluid via the process of exocytosis. The hormones are transferred to other cells in the body. These are called target cells. Specific receptors in the plasma membranes of the target cells permit the hormones to bind to the cells. When hormones bind to their specific receptors, they provide a signal to the target cell to alter its activity. Endocrine cells must be precisely regulated because just a small amount of hormone can produce a large effect. Endocrine cells respond to signal molecules. An activation or inhibition of the cell's activity results. Signal molecules can come from three sources. These sources of regulation include neural regulation, hormonal regulation, and humoral regulation. That's important to know. Signal molecules from nerve cells directly regulate some endocrine cells, such as those in the adrenal medulla. 
So when you look at this, the outer portion to it, if you look at the adrenal gland, there's that outer section that looks like that darker red and the inner section that's lighter pink. The outer part is called the adrenal cortex and the inner portion is the adrenal medulla. That's also very important to know. And because the structure is different, it functions different. And the adrenal cortex is gonna push out a few hormones that are called mineral corticoids, mineral corticoids. And when you think about mineral corticoids, what are they gonna be regulating? Certain minerals like sodium and potassium. Um, and that involves aldosterone. And then we have glucocorticoids. Again, glucocorticoids. Gluco is gonna tell you maybe it has something to do with blood sugar, maybe. Um, and that's cortisol, cortisone, and corticosterone. And then the inside, the adrenal medulla, is gonna be involved with catecholamines, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, or adrenaline and noradrenaline, okay? Let's continue. Nerve cell processes form junctions with endocrine cells. When a nerve impulse reaches the end of the nerve cell process, neurotransmitters are released. These neurotransmitters serve as signal molecules to activate the endocrine cell. Hormones secreted from one endocrine cell can regulate the activity of another endocrine cell. Hormones that target endocrine cells are called tropic hormones. Here, the hormone ACTH is secreted from the anterior pituitary and travels in the blood towards the adrenal cortex, its target cell. The horm so ACTH is adrenocorticotrophic hormone. So adreno tells you the adrenal gland, cortico tells you it's going to the cortex, adrenocorticotrophic hormone. It's bind to the target endocrine cells and control their activity. Some endocrine cells are regulated by changes in the blood concentration of certain ions or nutrients. Certain conditions in the body may result in increases or decreases in the blood concentration of certain ions like potassium or nutrients like glucose. Endocrine cell activity changes in response to the changing levels of these ions and nutrients. The regulation of hormone receptors is another mechanism that controls hormonal activity. The sensitivity of target cells to hormones depends on the number of receptors they have to a particular hormone. Receptor numbers can be up or down regulated. Hormonal effect on target cells resulting from receptor regulation is a kind of feedback control. Target cells will be understimulated if the levels of hormone are low. In a response called upregulation, target cells compensate for the low hormone levels by producing more receptors and thereby increasing their sensitivity to the hormone. Overproduction of hormones will result in overstimulation of target cells. In this situation, high hormone levels will cause target cells to produce a smaller number of receptors. This is called down-regulation. Think of insulin resistance. Target cells that are down-regulated are less sensitive to the signaling hormone. The cellular interactions between signal molecules and endocrine cells are a part of a much broader systemic regulation mechanism called feedback regulation. Feedback regulation is one of the main mechanisms for the regulation of hormone secretion. The components of a hormone feedback loop are the stimulus, change in condition, endocrine cell, signaling hormone, target cell, the target cell's action, response. The feedback occurs when the hormonal response from the target cell affects the endocrine cells that initially secreted the hormones. Depending on the effect of the hormone on the initial endocrine cells, a feedback mechanism can be either positive or negative. A positive feedback mechanism is one where the response stimulates the endocrine cell and causes it to be more active. The hormone oxytocin is produced in the hypothalamus 
and released in the posterior pituitary in response to the stretching of the uterine cervix during labor. In its turn, oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions that forces the fetus into the cervix. As the cervix continues to stretch, the release of oxytocin continues to increase until the cycle is stopped with the birth of the baby. And Another good example of a positive feedback loop besides uh, birth, I mean, you could think about uh, oxytocin being released and it makes the smooth muscle of the uterus contract and that contraction creates a lot of discomfort and pain for a woman. But yet you'd think that it would negate that, try and reduce it, and make it more comfortable, but it doesn't. It sends out more oxytocin and more oxytocin and more oxytocin, more pain, more pain, more pain, right? That's the positive feedback loop, bringing more of that same response until the baby's born and then the discomfort and pain subsides. Um, another positive feedback loop would be uh, for another life-threatening situation, let's say a gunshot wound or a, a laceration from a knife where the person is losing blood and they're bleeding. The body wants to compensate for that. So this clotting kicks in where there's more fibrin that's laid down in the endothelium of the blood vessels. More fibrin, more clotting, more fibrin, more clotting, more fibrin, more clotting. And it just keeps on happening until the bleeding stops, right? Okay, let's continue here. Now it's going to go on to a negative feedback loop, which is kind of the opposite, where it takes whatever is happening and try and does the reverse to that. So if you have high blood sugar, it'll try and bring it down. If your blood pressure is too high, it'll try and bring it down. If your body's too hot, it'll try and cool it off. Those are negative feedback loops. Negative feedback mechanism is one where the response reduces or eliminates the changes caused by a stimulus. Glucagon is the hormone produced in the pancreas in response to decreasing levels of glucose in the blood. Glucagon stimulates liver cells to convert glycogen into glucose and release it into the blood. As a result, blood glucose levels begin to rise. As the increase in blood glucose level approaches a normal homeostatic condition, Glucagon production is inhibited. A negative feedback mechanism is one where the response reduces or eliminates the changes caused by a stimulus. Glucagon is the hormone produced in the pancreas in response to decreasing levels of glucose in the blood. Glucagon stimulates liver cells to convert glycogen into glucose and release it into the blood. As a result, blood glucose levels begin to rise. As the increase in blood glucose level approaches a normal homeostatic condition, glucagon production is inhibited. Okay. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so when we compare the neural system and the endocrine system, if we look at the molecules uh, and then you look at the neural system, we have neurotransmitters, whereas we look at the endocrine system, we have hormones that are delivered to the tissues. When we look at the neural system, the site of action, it's close to the site of receipt at the synapse, as I drew out before, whereas the site of action for the endocrine system could be far from the site of release, usually and it binds to the receptor uh, on the target cell. The type of target cells for the neural system could be smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle, and for the endocrine system, cells throughout the body. The time to onset of action with the neural system, it's typically within milliseconds, and with the endocrine system, uh, seconds to hours or even days, and the duration could actually be even longer whereas the duration for the neural system could be pretty short. Uh, you know, if we look at what happens when someone gets into an argument, uh, someone's adrenaline rises and then that person can lose their appetite for hours and hours. That's more of an endocrine response, right? It can last for hours. But, you know, running up three flights of stairs, your heart rate may go up, you may sweat, your breathing increases, but then after a few minutes, 
it kind of gets back to homeostasis, okay? Um, the endocrine glands, uh, they're going to secrete their products into ducts. Um, so exocrine, think of, it's not really going into the bloodstream, that would be endocrine. Exocrine is designed to release it to the epithelial surface. Um, that includes sweat glands and oil glands, digestive glands. And that gets a little bit tricky for people to comprehend because, you know, when you think of sweat, it's going to the outside of the skin. And you're thinking of uh, sebaceous glands and oil also outside of the skin. Uh, but digestive glands, it's not delivering it to the outside of the body. It's still inside the body in the lumen, but yet it's to the epithelial surface. The entire digestive system is epithelium, as is the skin. So think of it that way. Uh, the endocrine is going to secrete hormones. Endocrine glands do not have ducts. Instead, they're going to secrete them directly uh, into the interstitial fluid. Uh, the hormones diffuse into the bloodstream through the capillaries, and they carry to the target cells. Uh, the endocrine glands include, and I'll show you an illustration or a picture that shows a variety of them. We'll go through some of the, the hormones that are released, but pituitary gland is one, pineal gland, thyroid, parathyroid, adrenals, and many, many others. Uh, certain organs and tissues that are not part of the endocrine system also secrete hormones because they contain secreting cells. Uh, the secreting cells can be found in the hypothalamus, uh, thymus, pancreas, ovaries, and testes, right? So there's a lot of overlap to these systems where the pancreas is part of the digestive system, but also uh, endocrine. The ovaries and testes, part of the reproductive, but also endocrine. The kidneys, part of the urinary but also overlaps with the endocrine. Stomach, liver, small intestine, right? Part of digestive system, but they act as a endocrine, they have endocrine function as well, as does the heart, fat cells, skin, etc. So if we take a look, uh, you can see there on the left, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the thyroid. And you're gonna hear a lot about what we call the HPT axis. Let me see if I can get the pen on here. Let me get back. I'm sorry about that. Okay. So we look at this, this to here. We have the HPT axis, the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis, but there's also the HPA axis between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal gland. They're all one releases a message that goes to the other gland and that releases a message that goes to the other gland and then that releases a message that goes to the target cell. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary uh, are within the brain as is to the right. You can see the pineal gland also in the brain. Uh, so there's overlap because when we talk about the neural system, we do mention these these uh, these parts, but they're linked to the endocrine system as well. So the hypothalamus produces ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. Um, you need to know these hormones by their name as well as their abbreviation. A lot of times on labs, you'll see abbreviations, not necessarily the name, uh, and oxytocin. So the hypothalamus produces them, uh, ADH and oxytocin, but it's going to store them in the posterior lobe known as the neurohypothesis. So it's gonna store oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone and it will release it, okay? Now, if there's a posterior pituitary, of course, there's gonna be an anterior pituitary gland, uh, anterior, anterior pituitary, also known as the adenohypothesis. And it releases adrenocorticotrophic hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, growth hormone, prolactin, follicular stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and melanocyte stimulating hormone. Um, and when we look at the thyroid, we think of metabolism. There's T4 and T3. T4 gets converted into T3. A little bit takes place in the thyroid. Majority takes place in the liver. And it is selenium dependent. Uh, besides T4, which is thyroxine, and T3, which is triiodothyronine, you need tyrosine for this. And it, there's, there's a, a flow for the production of this. And let's see if I can find you that flow. Give me a second to see if I can 
get to the picture that I'm looking for. There it is. So if we look here, you can see we have phenylalanine on top that gets metabolized into tyrosine. And from tyrosine to dopa, to dopamine, to norepinephrine, and epinephrine. This is called the catecholamine pathway. But there's an offshoot. If you want to create an extension or an arm off of tyrosine, it would actually fork into two arms. Tyrosine can give rise to melanin, okay, not melatonin, but melanin for skin pigmentation. And from tyrosine, we also get T4, which is thyroxine. And if you have four iodines attaching to that, then you get thyroxine, T4, four iodines latched to the tyrosine. If it's three, then it's triiodothyronine, okay? But the majority of that conversion uh, does take place in the liver, predominantly. Um, what else do we have? In the thyroid, we have calcitonin that's produced, and that's involved with calcium regulation. And what opposes that is the parathyroid gland. And the parathyroid gland is just behind the thyroid. If you look up on the right, let's make sure my pen is activated, and it is. So right here, the parathyroid gland, which is in the left lobe and the right lobe, uh, on the posterior side is PTH, parathyroid hormone. So PTH and calcitonin, they oppose each other, but both regulate calcium balance just in different ways. And we'll go over the mechanism that that takes place. The adrenal gland has a cortex, the outer part, and the medulla, the inner part. Uh, the adrenal medulla makes adrenaline, which is epinephrine, and it makes noradrenaline, or norepinephrine. And the adrenal cortex makes glucocorticoids, cortisol and cortisone and corticosterone. And what's interesting is that uh, we hear a lot of talk about the adrenals and adrenal exhaustion and adrenal fatigue due to cortisol production. But believe it or not, the majority of cortisol, about 80 to 90% of cortisol is actually made by the neurons. And that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, most stress can be emotional and you're thinking about the stress. So your neural system reacts and responds uh, with cortisol, um, as does the adrenal gland. And there is a really close, intimate connection between the sympathetics and the adrenal gland, right? Because it's the flight or fight response. Uh, the adrenal cortex uh, is also producing mineral corticoids or aldosterone and then the sex hormones, uh, androgens. Pancreas, which is a mixed gland, it's mixed because it's endocrine and exocrine. Uh, insulin and glucagon are endocrine. The exocrine portion is by the acinar cells that makes the digestive enzymes. Pineal gland, not to be confused with pituitary gland, a little bit more in the posterior portion where the pituitary is a little bit more anterior. There's the pituitary. Pineal is back here. Okay, and it's involved with your biological clock and deals with darkness and sleepiness, and that's melatonin. Remember, melatonin tones you down. There's some research now that's going into melatonin and its effects on the uh, intestines and being somewhat helpful for IBS uh, symptoms. Okay, what else do we have? We also have other uh, organs that have endocrine function, uh, the heart secretes naturetic polypeptides or naturetic peptides. One of them is ANP, atrial naturetic peptide and brain naturetic peptide. If you look at that word, natrium, natriu or natriuretic comes from natrium and we look at Na, that is sodium. So we're dealing with sodium regulation. So the atrial naturetic peptide and brain natriuretic peptide is involved as, think of it as the opposer or antagonist to aldosterone. Aldosterone is retaining sodium, whereas the ANP is trying to get rid of sodium. If you're holding on to sodium, you're holding on to water, blood pressure goes up. When you uh, inhibit aldosterone, 
and you activate atrium, that uretic peptide, you're losing it, so blood pressure can go down. Uh, thymus is involved in secreting thymusins, which is activating the immune system. Adipose tissue secretes leptin, but not only leptin, adipose is metabolically active. It's involved in releasing cytokines and many inflammatory cytokines. So extra adiposity or fat cells or obesity can take any inflammatory condition, whether it's MS, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, tendinitis, fibromyalgia, um, any type of inflammatory condition, hypertension, and make them worse due to the adip adipocytes being metabolically active, releasing cytokines, and these are pro-inflammatory chemical messengers. Uh, the digestive tract, there's a lot of secretion there, especially at the duodenum. Uh, at the proximal part of the duodenum, there's CCK, which is cholecystokinin, and cholecystokinin uh, is a hormone that when the stomach releases fat into it, um, CCK goes to the gallbladder, makes the gallbladder contract and pushes out bile. And bile is a fat emulsifier. Not only is bile pushed out, but so are phospholipids and uh, cholesterol and toxins. So having a healthy duodenum is important because if CCK isn't activated, you get the stagnation of what's stored in the gallbladder like cholesterol, toxins, calcium, and you can get stones that form there, right? You get gallstones. So um, let's see what else we have. The kidneys secrete EPO, erythropoietin. EPO goes to the bone marrow, pushes out red blood cells. You can see the word erythro, like erythrocyte. Erythropoietin is the production of, the production of red blood cells. Red blood cells carry hemoglobin. And hemoglobin, when we look at it, it's heme which has an iron and a non-iron containing portion. We know that iron binds to gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitric oxide. And um, poetin, uh, the production of. So you get the production of red blood cells. Iron is bound to a protein carrier, which is a globular protein. So it's called hemoglobin. We just don't want iron circulating in blood unbound because it can oxidize very easily. So we have a little protection there being carried by that transport protein. Then we have calcitriol, which is vitamin D, right? So in order to make calcitriol or vitamin D, you need the sun hitting the skin at a 90 degree angle. If we're in the Northeast, that happens from, uh, let's say mid-May to mid-September. And then the rest of the year, we're not producing it. So it's considered to be a conditionally essential um, vitamin and a fat soluble vitamin, but because we make it, it, it's also a hormone. So you need the sun hitting the skin at 90 degree angle. It hits some vitamin D precursors. It hits the subcutaneous cholesterol on the skin. It makes these vitamin D precursors and its first pit stop is going to be the, the liver and the liver hydroxylates it and it sends it to the kidneys where it makes the bioavailable form of vitamin D known as calcitriol. Great for bone density, great for the immune system. Just about every um, organ system in the body has some vitamin D receptors. It's not just for uh, bone density as was once thought. The uh, gonads, whether it's the testes or ovaries, they make uh, sex hormones. We'll get into some detail uh, with those. So really, when you look at this picture, you're like, wow, endocrine system is part of every, every system. Um, including the lungs. We didn't even mention the lungs, but uh, the lungs produce ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme. The liver produces angiotensinogen and angiotensinogen is inactive. It's got to be activated to angiotensin 1, which gets converted into angiotensin 2. And the lungs are involved in that conversion from angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And that uses ACE the angiotensin converting enzyme, which is a zinc dependent enzyme. Okay, let's take a look at the endocrine gland location video. Um, so this is uh, really not a video, but if you click on these structures, the hypothalamus, and it gives you all the different functions here at the bottom. Hypothalamus really controls your temperature, your thirst, your hunger. Uh, so a lot of eating disorders do take place up in the brain. Regulate sexual behavior, your defense reactions. Uh, it synthesizes hormones uh, that either stimulate or inhibit the secretion of pituitary hormones. 
and we know that it produces oxytocin and uh, ADH. And the hypothalamus, not to be confused with the thalamus, right? The thalamus is the relay station for all sensory input that, that's afferent that comes up into the brain, except for the sense of smell. Hypothalamus really controls so many different things because it's involved in regulating the ANS, the autonomic neural system, through sympathetics and parasympathetics. Okay, let's go back. There's the pituitary, and you have the anterior and the posterior pituitary, and you can review um, a lot of the functions here of the anterior lobe. So here's the posterior lobe, and here's the anterior lobe, and down below tells you what the anterior lobe synthesizes and what the posterior lobe synthesizes. So you can pause this and take a look. You can see the abbreviations as well as their names. You can see that the anterior lobe produces uh, seven uh, hormones and the posterior only those two. And then there's your thyroid gland. Take a closer look right there. And there are follicular cells that secrete hormone T3 and T4. But remember, T4 gets converted to T3. The amount of T3 that's produced by the thyroid is minimal in relationship uh, to the liver. Uh, but that's going to regulate oxygen use and your metabolic rate, cellular metabolism, and the growth and development. There are many, many uh, children um, that are short stature or not growing uh, at the average rate. And one of the hormones that they would check is the T3 and T4. They would run a thyroid panel on these children to see. Uh, so they don't get stunted growth. Uh, the parafollicular cells are going to secrete calcitonin. And as we mentioned before, that's going to regulate uh, blood calcium levels. Uh, it's going to lower blood calcium levels. Okay, let's see what else we have here. There's the parathyroid. So here's the thyroid. And on the posterior side, you got those four little parathyroid glands. Okay. And when we click on that, we can see that it's going to oppose calcitonin using PTH, parathyroid hormone. So calcitonin is really designed to decrease blood calcium levels and PTH is designed to increase it. We need calcium regulation. We need calcium because we need bone density. Calcium is involved with clotting. Calcium is involved with muscle contraction and nerve conduction. So many different things. We look at the liver. Let's click on the liver. And again, besides detoxification, the liver releases angiotensinogen. Now remember, anything that ends in ogen, angiotensinogen, ogen is inactive and it has to be activated. So you have the, the kidneys that make renin, and renin is going to convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. When you look at the word angio, it means blood vessel. Tensin sounds like tension. So this has to be involved in regulating the tension in blood vessels. And when you think about that, we're thinking about blood pressure, aren't we? Um, so, and then angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by what the lungs make, which is ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. Okay, let's go back here. And there's the kidneys. And when we look at the kidneys, it's involved with vitamin D production or calcitriol. We said it's involved with EPO, erythropoietin. We think of erythropoietin, we think of increased blood cells. We think of increased blood cells. We have cells that have hemoglobin. We have heme that carries iron. Now it can carry oxygen. So if oxygen levels dip, the body's going to push out more red blood cells to increase it. This is what doping is all about. This is what a lot of cyclists have used in the past. This is what a lot of athletes use to try and give them a competitive edge. And in many sports, it is illegal. Uh, so they do testing for this. And the small intestine. The enteroendocrine cells uh, produce uh, secretin, which promotes the secretion of bicarbonate ions. Uh, bicarbonate, you're thinking more of an alkaline or base to try and neutralize the acidity because whatever is dump, dumped from the stomach into the intestines can be somewhat acidic due to the high amounts of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Remember, the stomach pH is about 2 to 2.3. That is acidic. 
and the stomach can handle that acidity. It doesn't digest itself due to the mucus barrier and prostaglandin production, which produces mucus so that the stomach doesn't get an ulcer. Also, the CCK, the cholecystokinin, um, that is also involved in making the gallbladder contract, contract to push out the bile, which is a fat uh, emulsifier. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, hormones traveling through the body will only affect target cells that possess specific protein receptors, right? I mean, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone needs to find the cells that have a receptor specific for that, okay? Um, receptors are continually being synthesized and broken down. So we call these terms down-regulated or up-regulated as the video uh, showed before. Receptors can be down-regulated in the presence of a high concentration of a hormone, and receptors may be up-regulated in the presence of low concentration, right? If there's too little of something, we want more doorways to open to allow whatever's there in. And if there's too much of something, we want to down-regulate it, shutting the amount of doors or available windows. Okay, so this just shows the uh, endocrine cell through exocytosis. We see in the upper left there how it's releasing uh, that circulating hormone into the bloodstream. And then the bloodstream or that blood capillary is going to uh, release that hormone into the receptor of that target cell. Now, hormones that don't circulate, they're considered local hormones or paracrines. Uh, those that act on the same cell that secretes them are autocrines, and that's kind of interesting. So you can see on the bottom, the autocrine cell, that cell is releasing a hormone, and it's acting on itself. That's pretty cool. We'll see how that, get, that can get involved with osteoporosis and trying to protect the uh, bone cell from breaking down uh, using a hormone called osteoprotegrin, which is a, acts as a decoy. Now, hormones can be lipid-soluble or non-lipid-soluble or uh, fat-soluble and water-soluble. The fat-soluble, these are steroid hormones, thyroid hormones, and nitric oxide. And the water-solubles are amine hormones, peptides, protein hormones, and eicosanoid hormones. Uh, water-soluble hormones circulate freely in the plasma, and lipid-soluble hormones circulate bound to transport proteins. When we talk about proteins, remember they are the secret to life. There's so many different functions of proteins. They're enzymes, they're hormones, they make up cell membranes, they act as receptors, they can be part of the immune system, the immunoglobulins, and they can also be transport proteins. So when we look at the fat soluble, you can see some of the hormones like aldosterone, cortisol, uh, androgens, um, calcitriol, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Also, when we think of these fat solubles, we have to think of cholesterol. Uh, so we do need cholesterol in order to produce these. Uh, so on the right, it shows you the site of secretion. So aldosterone and cortisol come from the adrenal cortex and calcitriol from the kidneys, testosterone from the testes, estrogen and progesterone from the ovaries. Uh, thyroid hormones like T4 and T3, from the follicular cells of the thyroid. Remember, T4 gets converted to T3, a little bit at the thyroid, predominantly most of it selenium dependent at the liver. Um, and then you have nitric oxide, which affects the endothelial lining of blood vessels. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. And when fats or lipids uh, get oxidized or damaged, it inhibits nitric oxide so that blood vessels can't dilate and if they're not dilating, blood pressure goes up. The water-soluble amines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, we know those are the catecholamines secreted by the adrenal medulla. Melatonin tones you down, the pineal gland. Histamine, which is a vasodilator. These are produced by mast cells. This is a type of white blood cell, part of the immune system. These mast cells are in the skin, they're in the respiratory tract, they're in the digestive tract. So when you eat something that you're allergic to and you release histamine, uh, your skin gets itchy and red, your nose gets congested, your respiratory system gets mucousy and blocked. Um, so 
And serotonin also produced by platelets. So when you're not feeling well, uh, your platelets, your white blood cells are being utilized and not being utilized to make enough serotonin to help you feel good. Then you have the peptides and the proteins. So we look at oxytocin and ADH that's uh, released by the posterior pituitary. We look at the anterior pituitary with growth hormone and TSH and adrenocorticotropic hormone, FSH, LH, prolactin, melanocyte stimulating hormone, uh, the pancreas releasing insulin and glucagon and somatostatin, uh, the parathyroid glands producing PTH, the thyroid glands producing calcitonin, the stomach and the small intestine through the enteroendocrine cells producing gastrin, secretin, CCK, kidneys producing erythropoietin, your fat cells producing leptin. Uh, so those are all uh, the peptides and the proteins. And you can see on the left, you need these amino acids. We need protein in the diet. So it's not only that you need protein in the diet that's broken down into these amino acids, but you need hydrochloric acid in the stomach to break them down. Remember, it's not what you eat. It's what you can absorb. So you need to have good hydrochloric acid in the stomach to absorb that. And then we have eicosanoids, really important eicosanoids. Prostaglandins and leukotrienes are uh, the two arms of that. And um, I'll show you a nice uh, picture that kind of shows uh, the breakdown of these two and what their, what their effects are. But they're both involved in, um, there are good prostaglandins and there are some destructive ones. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, how, they target, uh, how they affect the body. Let's look at, this is a really important uh, short uh, video here that shows the action of fat-soluble versus um, um, water-soluble. Um, hormones and how they act on their target cells. How do they get in? How do they how do they affect the target cells? Okay, so let's click on this. Make this a little larger for you. Endocrine cells, located in various parts of the body, produce a large variety of chemical messengers in the form of hormones. Once they are released from the endocrine cells, the hormones diffuse into surrounding blood vessels and are transported in the blood. Exocytosis. The hormones are bound for their target cells, which may be some distance away from the point of secretion. Once they reach the site of the target cells, the hormones leave the bloodstream and attach to the target cell. Hormones can only affect their target cells when they are bound to specific target cell receptors. The manner in which the hormone interacts with the target cell depends on the chemical nature of the hormone. Based on their chemical structure and lipid solubility, hormones are classified into two groups. Lipid soluble hormones include steroid hormones and thyroid hormones. Lipid insoluble hormones include amines, peptides, and protein hormones. Lipid-soluble hormones, such as steroids and thyroid hormones, can easily pass through the lipid-rich plasma membrane. Once inside the cell, the hormone binds with an intracellular receptor, which is either in the cytoplasm or the nucleus of the target cell. This results in the formation of a hormone receptor complex. The hormone receptor complex is transported into the nucleus. The hormone receptor complex influences gene activity resulting in the DNA transcription and the production of messenger RNA. The mRNA leaves the nucleus and is translated to form a new protein in the cytosol. See how the messenger RNA moves through those nuclear pores? Remember in a very, very early on lecture, uh, how the nucleus has that nuclear envelope and then it has the nuclear pores and that's where that messenger RNA slip through. Now here on the left, the RER, that's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. 
And then you got the Golgi complex, which is going to repackage those proteins. Okay, so you got the rough ER, rough endoplasmic reticulum. What makes it rough is these ribosomes that make proteins, and the proteins have so many different functions. Then it's shipped to the Golgi complex where it repackages them and can send them out as either lysosomes, digestive enzymes, neurotransmitters. The new proteins alter the cell's activity. Lipid-insoluble hormones, such as peptide hormones, cannot pass through the plasma membrane and enter the target cell. They can only interact with the surface of the target cell. These hormones bind to membrane receptors on the outer surface of the target cell's plasma membrane. The binding of the hormone to its receptor sets off a sequence of events. First, it activates a G protein found on the inner surface of the membrane. That's important. In turn, the activated G protein transforms the signal from the receptor and activates the amplifier enzyme adenylate cyclase. The activated adenylate cyclase converts a large number of ATP molecules to cyclic AMP molecules, cyclic AMP. thus amplifying the signal received from the first messenger. Cyclic AMP works as the second messenger inside the cell. It activates kinase proteins. Kinase. Kinase proteins. proteins activate other enzymes through phosphorylation reactions. Phosphorylated enzymes can trigger a host of biochemical reactions that have profound effects on the target cell's activity. In this way, lipid-insoluble hormones, which cannot enter the cell, can still influence cell function through a second messenger, cyclic AMP, inside the cell. Okay, so what's interesting is, you know, you have water-soluble and fat-soluble hormones because remember the phospholipid layer, the outer part and inner part is hydrophilic. They like water. And then you got the inside of the cell membrane of that phospholipid membrane, that's all the lipids and the fats. So the water soluble and the fat soluble have different modes of entrance. One has the receptor on the outside, right? And then it opens up. The other has the receptor, then it has the primary and secondary messengers. That's for the, the fat soluble, okay? All right, let's continue on with the PowerPoint. All right, so the mechanism uh, of hormone action. So some of this may be a little bit uh, uh, repetitive because of the video that we just saw, uh, but uh, responses to the same hormone may vary uh, depending on the hormone itself and the target cell. The response may be the synthesis of new molecules, changing the permeability of the cell, stimulating the transport of a substance into or out of the cell, altering the rate of metabolic actions or causing contraction of smooth muscle or cardiac muscle. Remember the video that we just saw, there's the fat soluble hormones that bind to the receptor within the target cell. So you can see number one, you got the lipid soluble hormone. Then number two, it activates the receptor hormone complex that alters the gene expression. And then three, the newly formed messenger RNA directs the synthesis of specific proteins or ribosomes. The water-soluble hormone binds to the receptor on the exterior surface of the cell. So here you've got, number one, the binding of the hormone. You got the first messenger. I think I, I hopefully I, I, I didn't mess that up before. So if I did you know, I'm, I'm making the correction. I can't go back in the video just yet, but I think that I may have had that reversed. My, my brain went, you know, two steps ahead. Um, so in the water soluble, this is the one that's going to have the uh, second, the, pri the first and the secondary messenger system, not the fat soluble. Okay. So the water soluble can make it all the way through, right? You've got the 
hitting the binding the the hormone first right the, i'm sorry the, the 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 hormone is going to bind to that primary messenger and then he's got that g protein remember that whole cyclic amp amplifying the message so you're going to create this uh, binding of the hormone to its receptor it activates the g protein which in turn is going to activate the um the adenyl cyclase now you're going to have the activated adenyl cyclase that converts the ATP to cyclic AMP or cyclic AMP. And then the cyclic AMP is going to be that secondary messenger to activate the protein kinase. And then the protein kinase is going to phosphorylate the cellular proteins. And then you got those phosphorylated proteins that are going to cause all these different um, physiological responses. And then when you don't need the physiological response, you're going to have an enzyme that's going to break down the cyclic AMP, which is phosphodiesterase, right? And in the ends, an ACE is an enzyme. So that's the water soluble. The fat soluble, this is the one that's going to hit the membrane on the cell. It's going to activate a receptor and the hormone complex alters the gene expression. This has the primary and secondary messenger system for the water soluble. Okay, so how a target cell responds to a hormone, it's going to be based on the hormone concentration in the blood, the number of hormone receptors on the target cell, uh, the influences exerted by other hormones, because there could be synergistic effects or antagonistic effects. You can have two hormones that are going to amplify. You can have one that's going to antagonize it to inhibit or oppose the action. Hormones are secreted in short bursts when needed, and that's going to be regulated by the neural system and chemical changes in the blood and other hormones. So we spoke about negative and positive feedback loops before. We know the negative feedback loop is going to bring about the opposite type of reaction, and a positive feedback loop is going to bring on more of the same usually in life-threatening uh, situations like pregnancy, not pregnancy, but delivery and, uh, you know, hemorrhaging. Let's look at the feedback loop cycle. The endocrine system regulates many body conditions with feedback loops. Each feedback loop has the following components. Stimulus, a change in a body condition. Production cell, an endocrine cell that produces a hormone after being affected by stimulus. Hormone, the signaling chemical. Target cell, a cell receptive to the hormone. Action, what the cell does when affected by the hormone. Response, the overall change in controlled body condition as a result of the feedback loop. To learn more about specific hormone effects on various controlled conditions, follow these directions. Select the controlled condition from the menu bar above the diagram. Then, choose how you would like to stimulate that condition. Finally, choose a hormone from the list provided. To explore all the hormones and their effects on the controlled conditions, always begin by choosing a controlled condition first. Exercise, or not having recently eaten, causes a decline in blood glucose concentration that stimulates alpha cells in the pancreatic islets to secrete glucagon. Glucagon targets liver cells and causes them to undergo glycogenolysis, a process that breaks down glycogen into glucose. It also promotes the formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources a process called gluconeogenesis. The glucose is released into the blood and blood glucose concentration is restored to normal levels. So that can get a little confusing. Exercise. You, know? you want to be able to know the difference between gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. So glycogenolysis is taking glycogen and breaking it down, right? And gluconeogenesis is making different new forms of glucose or not having recently eaten, causes a decline in blood glucose concentration that stimulates alpha cells in the pancreatic islets to secrete glucagon. Glucagon 
targets liver cells and causes them to undergo glycogenolysis, a process that breaks down glycogen into glucose. It also promotes the formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, That's a, a process called gluconeogenesis. Good. The glucose is released into the blood and blood glucose concentration is restored to normal levels. A decline in blood glucose concentration caused by increased metabolic needs or physical exertion stimulates the release of growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. The releasing hormone targets the somatotroph cells in the anterior pituitary to secrete human growth hormone. Human growth hormone targets liver cells and causes them to undergo glycogenolysis, a process that breaks down glycogen into glucose. The glucose is released into the blood and blood glucose concentration is restored to normal levels. Human growth hormone also targets adipose cells. HGH causes adipose cells to undergo lipolysis, a process which allows cells to use fats for energy instead of glucose. With cells using fat for fuel, blood glucose is spared, so blood glucose concentration is returned to normal levels. In summary, HGH causes liver cells to undergo glycogenolysis. HGH causes adipose cells to undergo lipolysis. The resulting response of HGH secretion to both cell types is the increase in blood glucose levels. A decline in blood glucose concentration stimulates corticotropic cells in the anterior pituitary to produce adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. ACTH binds with cells in the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex and promotes the production of cortisol, the major glucocorticoid in the adrenal cortex. Cortisol targets liver cells and causes them to undergo glycogenolysis, a process that breaks down glycogen into glucose. It also promotes the formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, a process called gluconeogenesis. The glucose is released into the blood, and blood glucose concentration is restored to normal levels. Cortisol targets muscle cells and causes them to break down protein, thereby liberating amino acids into the bloodstream. The amino acids are used by the liver to produce more glucose. The glucose is released into the blood, and blood glucose concentration is restored to normal levels. Cortisol also targets adipose cells. It causes adipose cells to break down lipids, a process called lipolysis, thereby liberating fatty acids into the bloodstream. The fatty acids are used by the liver to produce more glucose. The fatty acids are also used by other cells for fuel, thereby sparing glucose and allowing the return to normal blood glucose levels. The glucose is released into the blood and blood glucose concentration is restored to normal levels. In summary, ACTH promotes production of cortisol. Cortisol causes liver cells to undergo gluconeogenesis. Cortisol causes muscle cells to break down proteins to amino acids. Cortisol causes adipose cells to undergo lipolysis. The total response of the actions of cortisol is to increase blood glucose levels. Certain situations, such as the absorption of a meal in the digestive tract, will cause blood glucose levels to rise. A rise in blood glucose levels stimulates beta cells in the pancreatic islets to secrete insulin. Insulin can bind to many cells in the body. Under the influence of insulin, the body cells increase uptake of glucose and amino acids. As glucose is removed from the blood, blood glucose concentration is restored to normal levels. Insulin binds to liver cells. Under the influence of insulin, liver cells convert glucose to glycogen, 
a process known as glycogenesis. As glucose is removed from the blood, blood glucose concentration is restored to normal levels. Insulin can bind to adipose cells. Under the influence of insulin, adipose cells convert glucose into triglyceride and fats, a process known as lipogenesis. Blood glucose declines towards normal levels. Increased insulin causes increased transport of glucose out of the blood, formation of glycogen, formation of fat. The total response of all the actions of insulin is to decrease blood glucose levels. Cellular needs for calcium may cause blood calcium concentrations to decline below the normal range. This decrease stimulates the principal cells in the parathyroid gland to secrete parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone binds to osteoclasts in bone tissue, promoting bone resorption and the release of calcium into the blood. As calcium enters the blood, blood calcium concentration is restored to normal levels. Parathyroid hormone also binds to kidney cells and promotes the production of calcitriol. Calcitriol binds with intestinal cells, causing them to increase absorption of calcium, which enters the bloodstream, restoring calcium levels to normal. Increased parathyroid hormone secretion promotes bone resorption and the production of calcitriol. The result of these actions is an increase in blood calcium levels. Nutrient absorption in the small intestine may cause blood calcium concentrations to increase. This rise stimulates parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland to secrete calcitonin. Calcitonin interacts with osteoblasts in bone tissue and stimulates them to take up blood calcium and deposit it in the bone matrix. This lowers the blood calcium concentration to normal. Dehydration, blood loss, and low amounts of water in the blood can cause blood volume and pressure to decrease. In response to declining blood volume or elevated blood osmotic pressure, neurosecretory cells in the posterior pituitary release antidiuretic hormone. In high concentrations, ADH can also cause vasoconstriction in the walls of arterioles. The narrowing of the lumen in these blood vessels raises blood pressure. ADH binds to the principal cells forming the walls of nephron tubules in the kidney, stimulating them to synthesize water pores and thereby increasing the permeability of the tubules to water. The reabsorption of water reduces water loss from the body, increasing blood volume and returning blood osmotic pressure to normal. ADH binds to the sweat glands. The secretory activity of the sweat glands decreases, lowering the rate of water loss through perspiration. Increased release of ADH causes water reabsorption in the nephron tubules of the kidneys, vasoconstriction of smooth muscle in arterioles, inhibition of sweat gland secretion. The total result of these actions is an increase in blood volume and pressure. In response to declining blood volume and pressure, juxtaglomerular cells of the nephron in the kidney release renin into the blood. Acting as a catalyst, renin aids in the conversion of angiotensinogen to the hormone angiotensin II. Angiotensin II targets smooth muscle cells in arterioles that provide blood to the nephron and causes these blood vessels to constrict. Because less blood is filtered by the nephron, less water is lost in urine, so blood volume and pressure rises. Angiotensin II targets the zona glomulorosa cells of the adrenal cortex and promotes production of another hormone, aldosterone. Aldosterone circulates in the blood to the kidneys. 
There, it promotes the reabsorption of ions, particularly sodium, from urine, and indirectly, water, back into the bloodstream. These actions result in raising blood volume and pressure. Angiotensin II targets cells in the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron within the kidney. Angiotensin II promotes the reabsorption of sodium and chlorine ions, setting up an osmotic gradient favoring the retention of water. Less water is lost in urine, so blood volume and pressure rises. In summary, renin promotes the production of angiotensin II. Angiotensin II causes vasoconstriction of arterioles. Angiotensin II promotes production of aldosterone. Aldosterone promotes reabsorption of ions and water. These combined activities result in increased blood volume and pressure. Many situations can elevate blood volume and pressure. In response to rising blood pressure, atrial cells in the heart will stretch, stimulating the secretion of atrial natriuretic peptide. ANP targets muscle cells in blood vessels and causes them to relax. This results in vasodilation and the lowering of blood pressure. Atrial natriuretic peptide also targets cells of the proximal convoluted tubule in the nephron of kidneys. There, it inhibits the retention of sodium ions, which reduces the retention of water. Less water returning to the blood causes blood pressure to return to normal. High levels of angiotensin II result from low blood pressure or low levels of sodium ions or high potassium ion blood concentration. These high levels stimulate the production of aldosterone from the zona glomulorosa cells of the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone binds to the principal cells of the collecting ducts of the nephron where it promotes increased sodium, chlorine, and hydrogen carbonate reabsorption from urine, increased water retention and reabsorption back into the bloodstream, and increased potassium and hydrogen secretion. The conservation of sodium, chlorine, and hydrogen carbonate ions, as well as water, and the elimination of excessive potassium and hydrogen ions, results in an increase in blood volume and pressure. In response to a decreased metabolic rate, or blood glucose concentration caused by increased metabolic need, or physical exertion, the hypothalamus increases secretion of thyrotropin hormone-releasing hormone, or TRH. Thyrotrophic cells in the anterior pituitary respond to rising levels of TRH and secrete thyroid-stimulating hormone, TSH. Thyroid-stimulating hormone binds to follicular cells of the thyroid gland and stimulates them to secrete thyroid hormones T3 and T4. Thyroid hormones bind to body cells, causing increased oxygen use and basal metabolic rate, an increase in cellular metabolism due to the production of more ATP from increased glucose catabolism, an increase in lipolysis, providing cells with energy for cellular metabolism from lipids. The overall result of these actions is increased fuel for a faster metabolic rate. The increased metabolism will result in increased body temperature. The thyroid hormones target muscle cells in blood vessels and the heart. The hormones cause vasoconstriction of blood vessels and contraction of the heart muscle, both of which increase blood pressure. The increased blood pressure and flow enhances the delivery of fuel molecules and oxygen to cells, supporting a higher metabolic rate. Thyroid hormones target body cells, including the skeletal, muscular, and especially nervous system cells during growth and development. Increased thyroid hormones increase protein synthesis, which promotes a metabolic rate necessary for normal growth and development of skeletal, muscular, 
and nervous systems. Low blood glucose, physical exertion, and increased sympathetic stimulation trigger the release of human growth-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. In turn, HGRH stimulates the production of human growth hormone from the somatotrophic cells of the anterior pituitary. Human growth hormone targets cartilage, bone, and skeletal muscle cells. In these cells, HGH increases protein synthesis, increases mitotic rate, and increases the levels of fuel molecules, glucose and fatty acids in the blood, which supports increased cell growth. The overall response to HGH is increased cell numbers supporting normal growth and development of the skeletal and muscular systems. Stressors such as declining blood pressure due to blood loss or strong emotional reactions trigger increased sympathetic stimulation from the hypothalamus to the chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla, causing the immediate release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine binds to the cardiac muscle cells of the heart. These cells constrict faster, increasing the heart rate and therefore cardiac output. Increased cardiac output rapidly increases blood pressure, thereby resisting stress. Epinephrine and norepinephrine also binds to smooth muscle cells of blood vessels. This alters the flow of blood through the vessels by increasing the flow through the brain, heart, lungs, and skeletal muscles, and reducing the flow of blood through the skin, urinary, digestive, and reproductive organs. Blood flow is diverted to those organs that are capable of rapidly resisting stress. Epinephrine and norepinephrine binds to liver cells. The hormones increase blood glucose by promoting glycogenolysis. Increased glucose is delivered to those organs that are capable of rapidly resisting stress. Epinephrine and norepinephrine binds to the smooth muscle cells in bronchioles. This promotes bronchodilation, allowing for greater airflow into the lungs. As a result, increased oxygen is delivered to those organs that are capable of rapidly resisting stress. In summary, epinephrine and norepinephrine promotes increased cardiac output, altered flow of blood through the vessels to appropriate organs, glycogenolysis, and bronchodilation. The overall result of these actions is an enhanced ability of organs to resist stress. Stressors such as declining blood pressure due to blood loss or strong emotional reactions stimulate the production of a hypothalamic releasing hormone, cortisol releasing hormone, CRH, as well as adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. In turn, these hormones stimulate the production of the hormone cortisol in the zona fasciculate cells of the adrenal cortex. Cortisol binds to muscle and liver cells. It causes muscle cells to break down protein and liberate amino acids into the bloodstream. The liver uses the amino acids to produce more glucose. Increased glucose is delivered to cells and organs so stress can be resisted. Cortisol binds to smooth muscle in blood vessels. It causes vasoconstriction, which counteracts a drop in blood pressure due to blood loss. Blood flow is maintained during stress. Cortisol binds to macrophages and lymphocytes. An increase in cortisol 
inhibits a macrophage's production of inflammatory producing chemicals, which helps reduce swelling in tissues. In addition, it inhibits proliferation of lymphocytes, reducing the immune response. In summary, cortisol promotes the breakdown of proteins for increased gluconeogenesis, vasoconstriction to raise blood pressure and blood flow, and suppression of immune responses. The overall result of these actions is greater ability of the body to resist stress. Stressors, such as declining blood pressure due to blood loss or strong emotional reactions, stimulate production of hypothalamic releasing hormone, GHRH. GHRH stimulates the somatotroph cells of the anterior pituitary to secrete human growth hormone. HGH causes liver cells to undergo glycogenolysis, the process that breaks down glycogen into glucose. In addition, HGH causes adipose cells to undergo lipolysis, which mobilizes stored lipids for energy use. The increased nutrients are released into the blood, travel to body cells, and are used to increase available ATP within the target cells. Stressors, such as declining blood pressure due to blood loss or strong emotional reactions, stimulate production of hypothalamic releasing hormone, TRH, which stimulates the production of thyroid stimulating hormone, which targets the follicular cells of the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormones. The thyroid hormones target body cells in order to promote an increase in cellular metabolism due to the production of more ATP from increased glucose catabolism and an increase in lipolysis, providing cells with energy for cellular metabolism from lipids. The overall result is an increase in oxygen, lipid, and glucose used to fuel a faster production of ATP within cells in order to reduce stress. Stressors, such as declining blood pressure due to blood loss or strong emotional reactions, stimulate production of hypothalamic releasing hormone, cortisol releasing hormone, and adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, which in turn stimulate the production of aldosterone from the zona glomulorosa cells of the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone binds to the cells of the distal convoluted tube and collecting ducts of the nephron, where it promotes increased sodium, chlorine, and hydrogen carbonate reabsorption from urine, increased water retention and reabsorption back into the bloodstream, and increased potassium and hydrogen secretion. The conservation of sodium and elimination of hydrogen prevents a lowered body pH during stress. In addition, water is conserved due to the osmotic gradient produced by sodium retention, which helps maintain blood volume in case of blood loss. Well, I don't know what else I could add to that. <laughs> what an amazing uh, review that was. But I'll give it a shot. So anyway, that's a good place. If you want to pause it here, absorb some of that information, I totally understand because uh, it was quite a bit. But I'm going to go on with uh, some more endocrine, but I know that that, gone, that went over well over an hour. So maybe you want to pause it and then come back. But a lot of what was covered uh, in that tutorial was just an outstanding, outstanding, incredible overview of all of those hormones, all of the organs uh, and or the glands that actually release many of them and what their effects are. I mean, that's really uh, quite amazing. Okay, so let's just review some of what was discussed there. Um, if we look at this illustration, it's showing the pituitary, anterior and posterior with the infundibulum. The infundibulum is the stalk that extends inferior from the hypothalamus. Uh, 
Uh, remember the anterior pituitary is the adenohypophysis, posterior pituitary is the neurohypophysis. And this gland sits in the bone in the cranium called the hypophyseal fossa, which is part of the cella tersica. Okay. Uh, the anterior lobe is going to secrete seven hormones. It makes up 75% of the weight of the pituitary gland. Posterior pituitary um, is made of neural tissue as well and releases two hormones that are produced by the hypothalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus secretes releasing and inhibiting hormones. So it's kind of like it controls the autonomic neural system or sympathetics and parasympathetics by either turning on the switch or turning off, right? Releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones. This is just a really good illustration showing anterior and posterior pituitary with the capillary or the apophyseal uh, veins and uh, the uh, portal system that surrounds it, which is responsible for delivering the hormones that are produced uh, to other cells. But you can see the bone here. That's a great picture showing the hypophyseal fossa on the bottom left there. You, you can see that terminology. And what's interesting is that some of these pituitary tumors are picked up incidentally um, from x-ray. Uh, there's a specific measurement of the pituitary uh, by going from this landmark right here to this landmark right here. If this landmark is wider, then they can only assume perhaps it's wider due to the fact that the pituitary gland is increasing uh, in size, expanding the bone. And typically when that takes place, there's gonna be some visual disturbances because the optic nerves crisscross right next to the pituitary, referred to as the optic chiasm. So usually there are some visual disturbances uh, as a result of these pituitary tumors. Okay, but also if there's a pituitary tumor, there's gonna be an abnormality to some of the hormones and that's why they run these hormonal pal panels looking at thyroid releasing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone and prolactin, etc. The hypothalamus pituitary gland connection, I actually like this picture a little bit better because it really does show very, very nicely. Up on top, we have the hypothalamus and then right here in the middle is the pituitary. So you can have the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis or the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. And it tells you how, it, what hormones the pituitary gland releases to signal the adrenal gland, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, or thyroid stimulating hormone to the thyroid gland, or growth hormone to the liver, or prolactin to the mammary glands, or follicular stimulating hormone to the testes and the ovaries, or luteinizing hormone to the testes and the ovaries, melanocyte stimulating hormone, oxytocin and ADH. And again, you have the anterior pituitary here, and then you have the posterior pituitary number two over there. The abbreviations are on the top right, as well as what they stand for. Uh, you can pause this and go over the hormone, and then you can see what it's secreted by. And you can see there's growth hormone, also known as somatotropin. There is, uh, let's see what I would like for you to know on this page. Um, here, I think for this page, this is just a nice summary. I would just like for you to know uh, on this page, at least for the, the hormones and the abbreviations, okay, for each. Um, I wouldn't worry about this just yet, okay? Negative feedback loop controls the secretion of thyrotropins, gonadotropins, and corticotropins. So here we can see that the hypothalamus is releasing corticotropic releasing hormone up on top. And then it's going to send that to the anterior pituitary that releases adrenocorticotropic hormone. It's gonna to go to the adrenal cortex releasing uh, where you have glucocorticoids, cortisol, cortisone, corticosterone. And then you've got here cortisol. And when the cortisol levels rise, you could see the red negative line for the negative feedback loop. 
to kind of affect the anterior pituitary and affect the hypothalamus by shutting them down. Uh, human growth hormone is the most plentiful anterior pituitary hormone, and it is released in bursts every few hours. Uh, we release it primarily after once you go to sleep. Uh, a lot of professional athletes know that. That's why they, they take uh, uh, several naps throughout the day if they could. Um, so that their muscles and cartilage and they regenerate a lot of cells and tissues. Um, there's some research pointing to the fact that if you have refined carbohydrates just before bedtime, it blocks the receptor sites for growth hormone to do their job. Um, and this may explain why if you do have refined carbohydrates for bed, maybe you wake up not as rested in the morning. Okay. Um, in summary, the anterior pituitary gland it's going to secrete human growth hormone, TSH, FSH, LH, prolactin, ACTH, and melanocyte stimulating hormone. You should know those. And here, this shows the principal actions of those hormones. So please take some time to read through these. Um, these certainly make uh, pretty good test questions uh, with their primary uh, and principal functions are. So when you think of growth hormone, we're thinking that it's going to stimulate the liver and it's going to stimulate muscle and cartilage and bone uh, and other tissues to synthesize and secrete insulin like a growth factors, which in turn promotes growth of the body tissues. When you look at TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, it's going to stimulate the synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormones. FSH, it affects both male and female. In female, it's going to initiate the development of the oocyte and induce ovarian secretion of estrogens. In the males, it stimulates the testes to produce sperm. LH, uh, luteinizing hormone, again, this is going to affect both males and females, but most people think of it as the female hormone. We see those commercials on TV when the couple is trying to get pregnant and she checks her LH levels by dipping you know, the stick in the urine, and then she calls up her husband and says, gotta rush home, gotta rush home, right? So when luteinizing hormone spikes, it's, um, it's symbolic of the ovulation, the time of ovulation, where the egg is, is pushed out. And uh, there's a very short window of 24, maybe 48 hours where that egg can get fertilized. So in females, it stimulates the secretion of uh, estrogen and progesterone and ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum. And in males, it stimulates the testes to produce uh, testosterone. Uh, prolactin, with other hormones, you know, if you look at the word pro, lactation, it's for milk production. And ACTH, it's gonna stimulate the secretion of the glucocorticoids, primarily cortisol, uh, by the adrenal cortex. You know, when I think of cortisol production, I think of the person who's under a lot of stress and then they're, they get the abdominal adiposity with chicken legs because it breaks down protein. So the muscles of the legs get broken down, but it starts to build up fat uh, around the belly. With increased cortisol, I also think of Cushing syndrome, which I will show you uh, a picture of that uh, shortly. And melanocyte stimulating hormone, the exact role of it is somewhat uncertain, but they think it can influence brain activity. And of course, by its name, melanocyte can cause darkening of the skin. Posterior pituitary, we're thinking oxytocin and ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Oxytocin is going to work on the smooth muscle of the uterus uh, for contractions of the uterus. Here, this just shows um, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So you can see on the bottom, the oxytocin affecting the uterus, even the mammary glands for secretion of milk. And then you have ADH, antidiuretic hormone, affecting the arterioles uh, and the kidneys. Antidiuretic hormone, holding on to water. So it's gonna shut down the kidneys and constrict the arterioles to hold on to water. Uh, oxytocin uh, is released in response to the stretch placed on the cervix during childbirth. We did that. Uh, it's going to enhance uterine contractions. The uterus has these different layers, the endometrium, myometrium, and the perimetrium. The middle layer is the muscular layer, which is smooth muscle. That's the myometrium. That's where oxytocin affects. And then it's going to stimulate the milk production by the mammary glands, okay, in response to the suckling reflex. That's oxytocin. ADH, antidiuretic hormone, 
this is secreted, the amount secreted varies uh, with blood osmotic pressure. Uh, ADH decreases urinary output as part of the negative feedback loop where osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus are gonna monitor the blood osmotic pressure. So if there's an increase in blood volume, it's gonna cause a decrease in ADH secretion. If there's a decrease in blood volume, it's gonna cause an increase in ADH. The thyroid gland, that's in the throat, it's that butterfly-shaped gland that's located uh, inferior to the larynx. There are both left and right lobes. It's connected by the isthmus. Uh, the follicular cells are stimulated by thyroid stimulating hormone to produce T4 or thyroxin and a little bit of T3, which is triiodothyronine, whereas the para follicular cells produce calcitonin, which is involved in calcium homeostasis. So there's a picture of the um, uh, thyroid gland. You can see the isthmus, which connects the two lobes. And on the bottom left, you can see the follicular cells and the para follicular cells, also known as the C cells. Think of the parafollicular cells or C cells, the C for calcitonin production for calcium regulation. Uh, T3 and T4 are synthesized and secreted in eight uh, steps. I'm not going to go over the eight different steps, but I just want you to see there on the top left there that tyrosine is involved. So if you remember back to that, um, the catecholamine picture where it went from phenylalanine to tyrosine, to dopa, to uh, L-dopamine, to norepinephrine, to epinephrine, uh, tyrosine is there. And we said tyrosine can be metabolized into melanin and to T4. And then T4 eventually gets metabolized to T3, primarily in the liver, and it is selenium uh, dependent. Uh, thyroid hormones are going to increase your BMR, your basal metabolic rate. It helps to maintain normal body temperature. So people with thyroid issues are either, you know, too hot or they're too cold. Uh, it's involved in stimulating protein synthesis. It increases the use of glucose and fatty acids for energy, for ATP production. It upregulates the beta receptors that attach to catecholamines, and it works with human growth hormone and insulin to accelerate uh, body growth. So you have thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus that's gonna to go to the pituitary and the pituitary releases thyroid stimulating hormone. That's gonna to go to the thyroid to produce uh, some thyroid hormones. Again, I'm not really interested in, in the steps with the exception of just a few that I will uh, point out. Tyrosine with four iodines is T4 and then T4 gets converted into T3, which is the active hormone. It is dependent on D2, uh, thyroxin deiodinase. It's a liver enzyme, and it is require selenium and bile acids. Why bile acids? Because bile acids break down fat, and the receptors on the target cells that T3 are gonna work on, they need fat. Um, so oftentimes we see some issues with gallbladders and thyroid issues going uh, hand in hand. Uh, TSH acts on the thyroid gland, which produces T4 and T3, the primary circulating thyroid hormone. The thyroid produces T4 in significantly greater quantities in a ratio of 17 to 1 uh, than T3, and which is approximately five times more biologically active than T4. So T4 is converted to more active T3 by deiodinase, D1, D2, and D3, primarily D2, in multiple tissue organs, especially the liver, a little bit in the gut, skeletal muscle, brain, and the thyroid gland itself, but the majority is done uh, by the liver. Uh, D3 converts T3 into an inactive form of the thyroid hormone, also in the liver. Uh, the transport protein produced by the liver, that's thyroid binding globulin, or TBG, also transthretin and albumin. Uh, they carry T4 and T3 to the tissues where they're cleaved uh, from their protein carrier to become free T4 and free T3 and bind to the thyroid hormone receptors and exert their metabolic effect. And all of these are measurable uh, in blood. Uh, TRH is secreted by the hypothalamus in response to histamine. Now, remember in histamine, there's histamine 1 and histamine 2. Histamine 2, I'm thinking primarily the stomach. I'm thinking the parietal cell in the stomach, 
uh, the parietal cell produces hydrochloric acid, and we have these H2, um, H2 blockers or H2 inhibitors, so that if someone has too much stomach acid or an ulcer, they take these H2 blockers, okay? Or they take proton pump inhibitors, um, but that's H2, right? Because you need histamine that hits the parietal cell, and the parietal cell makes the hydrochloric acid or it pumps out hydrogens, which binds to chlorine to make hydrochloric acid. Here, the hypothalamus has an H1 receptor. So this becomes a problem for people that may use antihistamines, uh, Benadryl and Claritin when they have these allergies. Sometimes they can have these subclinical uh, hypothyroid conditions. Uh, I mentioned bile flow, so bile acids are needed for the emulsification of fats. Uh, the essential fatty acids are needed for cell membrane function, and thyroid hormone is a fat-soluble hormone, and it needs a fluid membrane to reach its nuclear receptor. So poor liver or gallbladder function can lead to these subclinical hypothyroid conditions. The liver makes bile. The gallbladder stores the bile. Um, let's make sure we're good here. Yep, so goiter, we've seen goiters before. I'll show you a picture of it shortly. Uh, it's a term that refers to an enlargement of the thyroid gland. It's a nonspecific term. It doesn't indicate the cause of the increase in the size, but they're usually associated with hyperthyroidism, which is an overactive thyroid. It's commonly seen in Graves, Hashimoto's, or an iodine deficiency. And the symptoms um, are generally tachycardia and increased heart rate, weight loss, you can see this exophthalmos, which is the protrusion of the eyeballs. The skin is moist, they're warm, um, there's sensitivity to heat, there's fatigue, insomnia, and increased appetite or bowel habits. Graves' disease is an uh, autoimmune disorder, is known as toxic uh, diffuse goiter or thyrotoxicosis, and it's characterized by hyperthyroidism. Again, you, you see this goiter. There's a pre-tibial myxedema. It's a uh, rare complication where you'll see this um, non-pitting edema over the anterior part of the leg compared to pitting edema that you see with kidney issues when they're retaining water. When you push on the tibia with your thumb and you pull it away and your thumb depression still stays there, this is a non-pitting edema and also hypothalamus. This is uh, what myxedema looks like, that puffiness under the eyes with hypothyroidism. Uh, the exophthalmos, I'll show you a picture, which is the forward protrusion of the eyeball, which looks like this. And the Hashimoto's thyroiditis is believed to be the most common cause of primary hypothyroidism. It's more common in females than males, about an 8 to 1 incidence. Um, it is the autoimmune nature and general effects the individuals between 30 and 50. And what happens, the antibodies are going to resemble TSH. So you have antibodies resembling thyroid stimulating hormone. It's not TSH, but it's just like mimicry. It, it acts like it, it binds to the TSH, providing this constant overstimulation to the thyroid. So eventually it starts off like hyperthyroidism and then it just burns out, becomes hypothyroid, okay? What are goitrogens? These are substances that suppress thyroid gland function by interfering the uptake of iodine. Uh, there are foods in the brassica family like cabbage. Um, other goitrogens are soybeans, peanuts, strawberries, peaches, pine nuts, radishes, and horseradish. Good thing to know because a lot of people are on um, thyroid medication and they need to be, need to be aware of this. Um, here's your T3. Uh, and T4 showing the thyroid follicle or the follicular cells that are responsible for making them. And then you got the uh, parafollicular cells down below producing calcitonin. And again, it tells you their primary uh, function. Very important to know them. Remember, calcitonin and PTH, parathyroid hormone, work synergistically to regulate serum calcium, but they do it in opposite ways. Uh, PTH or parathyroid hormone is trying to increase, increase serum blood calcium levels, whereas calcitonin is decreasing them by trying to put some in the bone or release some through the uh, urinary system and to stop the absorption of it through digestion. So the parathyroid gland, there are two 
uh, in the right lobe and two in the left, superior and inferior lobes. And the parathyroid gland contains two types of cells, the chief cells and the oxyphil cells. So the chief cells are the principal cells that produce PTH or parathyroid hormone. The oxyphil cells whose function is not really known, um, but with, it says here, the, uh, the function is not known in normal parathyroid glands, but which secretes excessive PTH in cases of parathyroid cancer. So I would know primarily the chief cells or the principal cells, okay, in relationship to PTH. Uh, calcitonin is produced by the thyroid gland and it works in conjunction with PTH. And let's look at how they function here. So here we can see uh, on the right-hand side, PTH is released from the parathyroid gland. You could see right in the center, PTH is acting on the bone, the intestines, and the kidneys. So parathyroid hormone, its primary function is to increase the amount of calcium in the blood. So it's gonna do that by activating the osteoclast, breaking down bone. It's gonna do that by increasing calcium absorption from food, and of course you need vitamin D in order to do that. The kidneys make the bioavailable form of vitamin D to do that, okay? Uh, PTH, okay, we went over this already. Let's talk about osteoporosis just a little bit. And then on the bottom, we'll, we'll mention antigenic loads and rank and rankle system. So osteoporosis is a demineralization of bone, typically seen in inflammatory issues. And it's theorized that osteoporosis is caused primarily by an estrogen deficiency. And there's some current research out there um, that's done on mice that's shown that it's not just estrogen deficiency. And I can... Uh, I agree with that because I have many women, I have many patients that come in the office that are in their 70s that don't have osteoporosis. So there's another factor that's involved. And what we're starting to see is that it's decreased estrogen in the presence of an antigenic load, which means an upregulated immune system due to something that you put in the body that the body doesn't like. All right. So that's, uh, that's a really important thing. Um, but when insufficient estrogen is produced by the female, the parathyroid hormone that is present can significantly demineralize the skeletal system. Uh, osteoporosis can happen at any age. I'm starting to see it in younger and younger women uh, today due to poor lifestyle habits, more sedentary, more smoking, oral contraceptive, poor diets, um, and an increased antigenic load. Osteoporosis is visible on x-rays after 30% of the bone mass has been lost, and then they have symptoms when 50% of it has been lost. Usually the symptom is like the bone breaks, and they really weren't doing anything other than walking when a bone of the, like a metatarsal bone of the foot breaks or the hip breaks. And when it breaks, they lose their balance and they fall. And many of you have heard the story the other way around where grandma, grandpa fell, and when they fell, they broke the hip when it's usually the other way around. So cause of osteoporosis, there are some genetic factors, estrogen deficiency, poor diet, uh, smoking, uh, environmental factors, any type of antigenic load that's placed on the system. Let's look at the rank and rankle system. Let's see if I can go into this and show you a picture here. Let me get to it. There we go. If you look at this picture, you can see here uh, on the bottom, where you have an osteoblast, which builds up bone, and on the top left, you see an osteoclast precursor that breaks down bone, but it's a precursor. It's what you see on the right, the activated osteoclast that actually degenerates and breaks down the bone by releasing these very strong uh, enzymes. So the osteoblast has this rankle on it, which stands for receptor activated nucleocapa ligand receptor activated nuclear kappa ligand. Think of it as like a hormone. And it's gonna to bind to a receptor called rank, which is a receiver. The receptor is uh, receptor activated nuclear kappa. And when they bind 
when the osteoblast binds with the osteoclast precursor, it differentiates it into a mature osteoclast. So you have this um, bone remodeling that takes place where bone breaks down and it builds up and it breaks down and it builds up. And if it's breaking down at a faster rate than it's building up, well, then that's osteoporosis. And what the body can do is it can produce OPG, osteoprotegrin, which is produced by the osteoblast. So it produces its own hormone or its own receptor and it binds to the rankle. It blocks it like a decoy. And if those rankles are blocked, it never stimulates the osteoclast to break down the bone. And you can build up bone faster than it's breaking down. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint here. Uh, the adrenal glands, also known as the suprarenal glands, they're located on top of the kidneys. You can see that the outer part is called the adrenal cortex. The inner part is the adrenal medulla. The cortex makes the glucocorticoids and the um, uh, mineral corticoids. The glucocorticoids are cortisol, cortisone, corticosterone. The mineral corticoid is aldosterone. And then the adrenal medulla produces the catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine. The cortex is divided into these three histological regions, the zona glomerulosa, you can see on the, the right, and that's going to secrete the mineral corticoids, as, such as aldosterone. Then the zona fasciculata, just deeper to that, it's going to secrete the glucocorticoids, primarily cortisol. And then you have the zona reticularis that's going to release and secrete the epinephrine and norepinephrine, or adrenaline and noradrenaline. So the mineral corticoids are regulating the mineral homeostasis like sodium and potassium. The zona fasciculata, which is involved with the glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids affecting glucose homeostasis. And then the zona reticularis secreting androgens that are going to um, associate it with the masculin masculinization. Aldosterone regulates sodium potassium balance. And let's talk a little about the RAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. Just by looking at it, renin, the first three letters of renin is R-E-N, like renal. We know that that's going to be released by the kidneys. Angiotensin, angio is blood vessel. Tensin sounds like tension. And then aldosterone, we know it's a mineral corticoid dealing with sodium. So if we look up on the upper right where you have dehydration, there's a hemorrhage or there's sodium deficiency, it's going to lead to a decrease in blood volume, which is going to decrease the pressure and the kidneys don't like that. It wants to keep blood and pressure moving through there so that engine doesn't burn out. It always wants fluid and pressure going in. So as a result, you have the kidneys producing renin. And to the left there, you see the liver is producing angiotensinogen. Ogen is inactive. The renin bumps into angiotensinogen, activates it into angiotensin 1. Now, if there's an angiotensin 1, there's got to be an angiotensin 2. What makes that conversion is ACE. See the lungs there at number 8? That's angiotensin converting enzyme, which is zinc dependent. It's going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2's goal is to increase blood pressure. It's got a few ways that it can do that, but that's the ultimate goal. Now, that's why when people have high blood pressure in the medical realm, the pharmacological approach could be to give someone an ACE inhibitor. If they have an ACE inhibitor and they're blocking the ACE enzyme, you never convert angio-1 into angiotensin-2, which means blood pressure never goes up. But if we do have an increased angiotensin-2, that's going to do a few things. You look at number 15, it's going to increase vasoconstriction. That's going to increase blood pressure. It's going to stimulate the adrenal cortex. You're going to push out cortisol. That's going to increase uh, blood pressure. It's going to increase aldosterone for sodium reabsorption. Sodium or salt and water, that's going to increase pressure. When you have more salt, water follows minerals. If you're losing salt, you're losing water. If you're holding on to salt, you're holding on to water. So you're gonna have vasoconstriction. There's also ADH production. So you have anti-diuretic hormones, so you're holding on to water. Aldosterone production, as a result, so you're holding on to sodium. You got vasoconstriction. It's gonna make you crave salt and it's gonna make you thirsty. So you're craving salt, you're gonna eat potato chips and pretzels 
and then you've got aldosterone, so you're going to hold on to that. Then you're thirsty, so you're going to drink the water. The body produces ADH, antidiuretics. You're going to hold on to the water. So you got salt and water. That's going to increase pressure, plus the compound interest of vasoconstriction, and blood pressure goes up. Isn't that beautiful how that works? Um, the adrenal gland secretes glucocorticoids, uh, cortisol, or hydroxy or hydrocortisone. That's the most produced. Then you got cortisone and corticosterone. It's going to help to control protein breakdown, glucose formation, lipolysis or lipolysis, which is fat cell breakdown, resistance to stress. It's involved with inflammation and the immune response. The adrenal glands are also involved in making a major androgen, which is secreted by the adrenal cortex, and that's DHEA, dehydroepiandrosterone, DHEA. Now, in males, after puberty, the hormone testosterone is secreted in much larger quantities, so DHEA is going to have very little effect. In females, DHEA and other adrenal androgens play a major role in promoting libido and are converted into estrogen. In menopausal women, all female estrogens come from adrenal androgens. The adrenal medulla is stimulated by the sympathetic preganglionic neuron of the ANS, the autonomic neural system. And there are chromaffin cells that secrete uh, adrenaline or epinephrine and norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Both are involved in the sympathetic response, which is fight or flight response. When you have the sympathetic neural system that's stimulated or thoracolumbar output that's stimulated fight or flight, your heart rate is faster. Your pupils are dilated so you can see better at night. Your pupils, uh, your, your, your bronchi and trachea are dilated so you can get more air in. More air is more oxygen. More oxygen is more energy. And you can have increased blood pressure to drive that red blood cell and drive the oxygen to the muscles and tissues so you can get out of danger's way. So you can see here on the left and on the right, you got short-term stress and you got long-term stress on the right. We want the adrenals, right? You've heard of adrenal exhaustion or adrenal fatigue. So on the left-hand side, you can see that you've got output going from the hypothalamus right to the spinal cord, from the spinal cord to the adrenal medulla, which pushes out the catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine, or noradrenaline and adrenaline. Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, you can have increased glucose, right? So now you look at this, you go high blood pressure, high heart rate, high blood sugar. No wonder why stress kills, right? That's the adrenal medulla. Then you go to the right side, and now you look at the adrenal cortex pushing out mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids. This is when the stress goes on and on and on and on for longer periods of time. You're going to retain sodium and water by the kidneys. You can have increased blood volume and blood pressure. You got the proteins and fats converted to glucose, you're going to have high blood sugar, you're going to have increased blood glucose, suppressed immune system, again, stress kills, and it's going to increase cholesterol production. So you got high cholesterol, high blood pressure, cortisol is pushed out, so you're going to have adiposity around the abdomen region, pro-inflammatory, stress kills, right? Prolonged stress really does kill. When you're pushing out cortisol, this is what Cushing syndrome looks like. You get that moon face, you get that purple striae, look at the skin, very thin skin, you get that buffalo hump in the back around that, you know, upper thoracic region, red cheeks, you get that edema, you get that swelling around the, the feet and the ankles, you get that big belly. So Cushing syndrome is really uh, a response to prolonged exposure to elevated levels of either endogenous, meaning your body is producing its own uh, cortisol or exogenously from uh, excessive, um, you know, uh, cortisol or prednisone type of medication. That's what it looks like. So if you're doing a nutritional physical exam on someone and you happen to see this or you have family members that have this, you're thinking that there's an endocrine uh, issue going on here. Other pictures of what it looks like the very thin skin, the moon face in A, the buffalo hump in D, the purple striae in, in C. Okay, so you can take some time to pause, look at the hormones, and look at the principal actions as review on the right-hand side. Pancreas is located 
uh, in the curve of the duodenum. Remember, it's endocrine and exocrine, so it's a mixed gland. And the endocrine portion is going to be dealing with insulin and glucagon, and the exocrine portion, primarily the acinar cells that are involved with the digestive enzymes. The endocrine portion are more the, the islets of Langerhans, and uh, there are alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells, and F cells. The alpha cells um, release glucagon to increase blood sugar, and the beta cells are producing insulin. These are antagonistic to one another. Then there's the delta cells for somatostatin and F cells for pancreatic polypeptide. When you look at glucagon and you look at the primary action, it's raising blood glucose levels. So the uh, alpha cells are producing it, it goes to the liver, and it's involved with glycogenolysis. So it breaks down glucose in the stored form, which is glycogen, and when you're breaking it down, that's the lysis. So it's glycogenolysis and converting it into glucose. Insulin is going to lower blood glucose levels. Then you have somatostatin that inhibits the secretion of insulin and glucagon, so it's going to slow the absorption of nutrients from the GI tract. And then you have pancreatic polypeptide from the F cells, which inhibits the somatostatin secretion, gallbladder contraction, and secretion of the pancreatic digestive enzymes. So here we have the pancreatic islets. I kind of like this picture. It shows the homeostasis taking place. There's the seesaw and what happens if the blood sugar rises or declines. So on the left-hand side, if it rises, there's the imbalance, the pancreas pushes out insulin. And insulin is going to stimulate glycogen formation. It's going to store some of it in the liver in the form of glycogen. Okay, Or it's going to increase the uptake by the GLUT4 receptors on cells so the cells can take them in. Either way, the, it's going to lower the amount of um, glucose that's in the blood. And if it drops too much then the um, alpha cells are going to produce glucagon that goes to the liver for glycogenolysis, breaking down the glycogen into glucose, and the glucose levels rise again. Diabetes mellitus um, is when there's hyperglycemia, and typically the three cardinal signs are going to be uh, polyuria, which is peeing too much, polydipsia, excessively thirsty, and polyphagia, increasing in hunger. The gonads, the ovaries, and the testes, um, the ovaries produce two uh, estrogens, estradiol and estrone, along with progesterone, relaxin, and inhibin. And the testes are going to produce testosterone. So together, when you look at estrogen and progesterone, these gonadotropic uh, hormones of the anterior pituitary re regulate the female reproductive cycle. Um, it's involved in maintaining a pregnancy, especially uh, progesterone, right? That's really going to prepare the uh, uterus for, um, for pregnancy. It's going to prepare the mammary glands for lactation, promote the development of maintenance of the female secondary uh, sex characteristics, especially estrogen. Uh, relaxin is going to increase the flexibility of the pubic symphysis during pregnancy, allowing dilation of the uterine cervix. Inhibin inhibits the secretion of FSH, the follicular stimulating hormone. Uh, testosterone stimulates uh, the descent of the testes before birth, regulates sperm production, promotes development and maintenance of the male secondary sex characteristics, and then inhibin is going to do the same thing it did in the female. It's going to inhibit the secretion of FSH, the follicular stimulating hormone, from the anterior pituitary. Pineal gland is involved with melatonin production, which regulates the body's biological clock. Uh, and then the thymus, which is located deep uh, or behind the sternum, between the lungs, and it produces thymosin uh, and thymic humeral factor and thymic factor. And all of these are really involved in promoting the maturation of your immune system T cells, the T for thymus. The B, when you hear of B cells, that's from the bone marrow. So again, you can see the pineal gland in that picture in the upper right, not to be confused with the pituitary gland. Pineal is behind, kind of just superior to the cerebellum. 
you could see the ovaries on the bottom right. And again, you could see the thyroid and parathyroid on the top left and all these uh, secondary organs. So let's talk about some of these other unique ones that are kind of interesting. So you have the uh, skin, which is involved with cold calciferol. Remember we said in order to make vitamin D, you need the sun hitting the subcutaneous cholesterol on the skin, and then it goes to the liver where it hydroxylates it, and then it goes to the kidneys where it hydroxylates it again. Um, so the skin is involved. Um, then you look at the GI tract where there's gastrin that's produced and it promotes secretion of gastric juice to increase the movement of the stomach. Uh, then there is secretin, which stimulates the secretion of pancreatic juices and the bile. CCK, which is involved in making the gallbladder contract. The placenta, not many people think the placenta is an endocrine organ, but it does. It produces HCG, which is human chor chorionic gonadotropin. That's one of the main hormones that they look at to see if a woman is pregnant. It stimulates the corpus luteum in the ovary to continue to produce uh, estrogen and progesterone to maintain a pregnancy. If HCG dips, then they know there's um, unfortunately a miscarry that's taking place. Estrogen and progesterone also help to maintain a pregnancy. It's also involved in preparing the mammary glands to help secrete uh, milk. Kidneys are producing renin. We spoke about that with the RAS system erythropoietin to increase red blood cell formation, which is designed to carry more oxygen to increase energy levels. Uh, we spoke about the kidneys producing the active form of vitamin D called calcitriol. The heart helps to produce ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, natrium is sodium. So if you can get rid of sodium, you're gonna decrease pressure. And then the adipocytes, uh, adipose tissue producing leptin. It's really designed where if you're eating fat, you have some good healthy fats like some avocado, it's gonna to help to suppress the appetite, okay? It may increase follicular stimulating hormone activity and luteinizing hormone activity as well. And remember, adipocytes are always, re always releasing these inflammatory cytokines, so obesity is horrible for any type of inflammatory condition and makes them worse. Let's look at the eicosanoids. These are derived from arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is in the cell membrane. It's found quite a bit in animal produce. It's found pretty highly in peanuts and shellfish. The more arachidonic acid, the more potential there is for inflammation to take place. So the hormones that come from the arachidonic acid are leukotrienes and prostaglandins. Uh, leukotrienes influence white blood cells and inflammation, and prostaglandins also are involved in inflammation, smooth muscle contraction, platelet function. Um, it's involved in producing mucus in the stomach. So it helps to explain why if someone is uh, using aspirin or taking too much aspirin and they're blocking prostaglandins, they're not gonna make mucus in the stomach, the acidic environment wins and you tend to get ulcers. It also explains why when you use some of these anti-inflammatories, uh, uterine contractions during menstrual cramps typically go away. It also explains why it makes fever go down, right? Ibuprofen and other NSAIDs uh, treat pain or inflammation, fever. Let's take a look at the pathway here. So on the top, you've got arachidonic acid. We told you where it comes from. It's found in the cell membrane wall. And you've got the prostaglandin pathway to the left that leads to pain and inflammation and swelling. And then you have the 5-lipoxygenase pathway to the right, which is going to uh, stimulate leukotrienes, which creates more of your airway constriction and airway obstruction symptoms like asthma. On the left, the prostaglandin is more pain, inflammation, and swelling. Okay, so you can see where aspirin comes into play. These COX-2 inhibitors come into play and these leukotriene inhibitors off to the right. Um, inflammation is made in response to tissue damage and it's mediated by bradykinin. Uh, bradykinin binds to the G protein that we learned about earlier and it's gonna stimulate phospholipase A1 or PL, PLA or phospholipase A1. And the PLA, or phospholipase A1, is going to cause the release of the arachidonic acid from the phospholipid bilayer. And then the arachidonic acid, we said that's the precursor to the two inflammatory eicosanoids, 
which was the LOX and the COX enzymes. Um, the answer to how aspirin or ibuprofen work was discovered in about 1971 and inhibits a key enzyme in the prostaglandin synthesis without affecting the synthesis of the leukotriene, so it affects one of those inflammatory arms. And typically it's used to treat a lot of inflammatory disorders. Very good in treating uh, fever, in, re in helping to reduce pain, but we also know at the expense of what, right? Stress response, you stress and distress. So you stress is helpful. Uh, everyday stress that prepares us to meet the challenges. We do have to be able to adapt to them. The distress is any type of harmful stress that could be damaging. This constant and chronic fight or flight response that isn't acute, but it's more chronic. That's a problem. Uh, the resistance reaction is the second stage in the stress response and lasts longer than the flight or flight response. And that leads to that ad adrenal burnout or adrenal exhaustion. Here, again, it shows how uh, stress can kill. We did go over this a little bit earlier. We have on the left-hand side, the more acute stress from the adrenal medulla, and on the right-hand side, more of the, the chronic stress. And it shows you some of the long-term effects of that. Uh, aging brings about changes in levels of most hormones. Uh, some hormone levels increase while uh, some do decrease. Uh, the levels of other hormones like epinephrine and norepinephrine pretty much remain the same. Uh, histologically, most of the endocrine glands reduce in size and contain increasingly more fibrous connective tissue with age, and that tends to be non-functional. Really important slide because once again, from a functional perspective, we're looking at how the endocrine system correlates to every other system, and I think that this is really important uh, to understand. So I want you to pause this. Most of this we've already covered in this entire lecture, but pause it, make sure you print it up and know the connections, okay? Really important. Um, and then some of the endocrine disorders, pituitary giantism and acromegalia, these are caused by an excess secretion of growth hormone. Giantism is gonna happen in young children. Acromegalia is gonna happen in the adults. Uh, goiter we spoke about, which is a reduction in the production of thyroid hormone. Uh, Graves disease we also spoke about, seeing that exophthalmos, uh, which develops due to uh, hyperthyroidism. And then the Cushing syndrome, we showed you the picture of how you have the purple striae, the moon face, the buffalo hump, and um, all of those other symptoms due to high cortisol production. And here's just a nice picture of showing, you know, the giantism on the left-hand side, the acromegalia in the middle, you see the, the big thick forehead and the, the, the uh, orbital ridge, how thick that is and the strong jawline. You can see goiter on the top right. You can see the Cushing syndrome on the bottom right, the exophthalmos, okay? Okay, you can click on the hormone function and action. This is like a really good summary of everything but everything that we've already covered. Um, let's see if we can show this. I don't think it's very long. I think it's about two minutes. So let's, let's show it. The endocrine system, along with the nervous system, controls body activities. In the nervous system, neurons provide rapid cell-to-cell -cell communication at a distance with a short lasting response. Most endocrine cells communicate slowly at a distance with long-lasting responses. Endocrine production cells communicate with target cells in the body using chemical signals called hormones. Most endocrine hormones are circulating hormones. These chemical signals travel through the bloodstream, facilitating communication between a production cell and a target cell. They pass from the secretory cells that discharge them into interstitial fluid and then into the blood. Only target cells with the appropriate hormone receptor will respond to the hormone signal. There are generally two chemical types of circulating hormones. Hydrophobic hormones, like estrogen, are also known as steroids and are derived from cholesterol. These hormones tend to be lipid-soluble. Hydrophilic hormones, like insulin, are based on amino acids, so they tend to be water-soluble. The chemical category, hydrophobic or hydrophilic, determines the method by which the hormone affects the target cell. 
Hydrophobic hormones are bound to a carrier protein as they travel through the bloodstream. These steroid hormones easily diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer of the target cell's membrane and bind with receptors within the nucleus. This binding forms a hormone receptor complex that directly affects gene expression. Targeted DNA sequences are then transcribed into mRNA. This results in the synthesis of new proteins. The new proteins are often enzymes which alter the target cell's activity. They cause cellular responses that are unique to that hormone. Everything from changing metabolic or contraction rates to the synthesis of other chemicals, including hormones, may be altered under the influence of a hydrophobic hormone. In contrast to hydrophobic hormones, hydrophilic hormones cannot pass through the target cell's membrane. These water-soluble hormones must bind to a receptor on the membrane. When a hydrophilic hormone binds to the hormone receptor, a G protein is activated. The activated G protein stimulates the membrane-bound enzyme adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP into a second signal or messenger, known as cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP acts to activate pre-existing cellular enzymes known as kinases. In a cascade of events, these enzymes either activate or inhibit other cellular proteins. While the action of the second messenger, cyclic AMP, is short-lived, the net result of the hormone signaling is an alteration of the target cell's physiological response. Even though the mechanism of action is different in water-soluble hormones, the range of physiological responses can be similar to those found in steroid hormones. The homeostasis of many of our body's controlled conditions, such as blood pressure, blood glucose levels, or metabolism, are maintained by the mechanisms of action of the hormones that the endocrine glands produce. These chemical signals are vital to our well-being. Perfect. Okay, I think we're at the very end of the lecture here. Let's make sure. I'm pretty sure that was the last slide. Yep, that was it. Okay. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. I know it was a little bit long, but lots of great information there on the endocrine system.